Let's look at James 1, 12 to 15, and we'll also go back up and look at uh, verses 2 through 4, with a view to asking, what's the difference between being tested and being tempted? Uh, Because we're told that God cannot be tempted, and yet Christ was tempted with evil. Um, so there's a, in, in, in James's mind, there's a understanding of temptation and trial, and it's the same Greek word. That's what makes it so interesting and puzzling. Perosmos is often translated trial or test and sometimes translated temptation. So sometimes it's very negative and sometimes it's, it's not negative. So that's what we want to look at. Father, as we dig into this, we don't want to in any way impute to you anything uh, wrong or sinful or evil. And so show us, Lord, in what way you're involved uh, with being tested or tempted and, and with uh, what way you're involved in our tests and temptations. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. That could be translated temptation. Same word in Greek. Steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, and that could be translated tested, I am being tempted or tested by God. For God cannot be tempted or tested with evil, and he himself tempts, tests no one. There's a rub, right? God does test us. We'll see texts about that next time, but that's why I'm leaving it as tempts here and and saying James has a very particular meaning to say uh, God tempts no one, though he tests all his children. But each person is tempted, tested when he is lured and enticed. Here we're getting close to the peculiar definition that he has. Lured and enticed by his own desire, when desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, that's what we're going to look at next time. Let's go here, because this sets up a a parallel with what we're going to find here. This is a continuation of the verses earlier and functions as the climax of it. So let's go there first. Two and four, two through four. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials. There's that word again, perosmois. So I'm going to put uh, trials here. Is that Greek word, trials. When you meet various trials, trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So let's put that yields tested faith. Testing of your faith. And that yields produces steadfastness. So let's put that here. Stead, stead, fastness. Another word for that is endurance or perseverance through test. And let test steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So let's, let's sum all that. That full effect is this, this, and this. And maybe we'll just use the one word complete. We could use any one of them or all of them, but just to keep it simple. So we meet trials. Our faith is tested. We prove to uh, be steadfast. And that steadfastness, as it goes on, uh, experiences completeness. We are complete. Now that's where this text stops. But Here, a few verses later, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. So now we see uh, the blessedness is mentioned, and that blessedness back here is this, so far, this is the blessedness, right? 
have its full effect, perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. That's a wonderful blessedness, but it's going to go further now in 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. So let's go back and finish it. This perfect, complete, lacking in nothing yields crown of life when we are raised from the dead or when we meet Christ in heaven. So there's the sequence of the positive view of Peiras Mois. Now, next time, we're going to look at the negative view when it's called temptation and see what that sequence is and see how this right here maps on to this right here, this sequence. But before we sign off, let me pose one other question here because I didn't finish the sentence in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who, and you might have expected him to say, to those who remain steadfast under trial. And he didn't. He said those who love him, which causes us then to realize, or at least ask, so in James's mind, what's being tested here is, is love for God. And back here, it's faith. Would you not agree that when we meet uh, various trials, we are being tested as to whether we will trust God, and James would say, as to whether you love God. And that causes me to ponder what the nature of faith is, so if our faith is being tested, and if it, if it proves to be steadfast under trial, and it is rewarded with the crown of life, and then he says it differently here in saying, actually what's being rewarded is love to God, then we have to go back and say, well, then faith is not just, well, let's do it like this, receiving, what, receiving Christ as what? As what he is. Savior, Lord, we could add counselor. Like if you reject all Jesus' counsel, you don't have faith. And I would add then treasure. Whatever, whatever is in Christ that corresponds to love. Do we love him? Do we love God? God, you, you, you can use God as a savior and not love him. And you can uh, bow like a slave to his authority as Lord and not love him. But James won't have it, will he? No. Loving God is is essential, I think, in James's mind to trusting God, which is why he doesn't have the slightest hesitation in saying, the steadfastness of your faith under trial wins the crown of life because the crown of life is promised to those who love him because love is implicit in faith. Now, we'll come back next time and ask about God tempts no one, but he tests them. How do we sort that out?